Uh, okay, so hello, is this working? Gary gives me the high sign. Uh, I'm David Goff, Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health, but more importantly for today, Chair of the Search Committee for the Dean for the School of Medicine. Uh, and it's my great privilege to introduce to you uh, Dr. John Riley, who will be uh, presenting at this forum and interacting with you, giving you an opportunity for some interaction. Uh, so Dr. Riley is the Jack D. Myers Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He went to Pitt in 2008 as a Professor of Medicine and was named uh, the Myers Professor and Chair of Medicine in 2011. Uh, he's an impressive researcher who's um, authored over 100 peer-reviewed uh, research reports and uh, co-authored chapters in, in two very well-known textbooks in internal medicine. His area of personal research is in the genetic environmental factors associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, in particular the role of alveolar macrophage enzymes and emphysema, COPD, and lung cancer. As a, pulmonary, as a public health doc, it's a while since I've thought about alveolar uh, macrophages, but bring back painful memories. Uh, Dr. Riley graduated from Harvard Medical School after an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Dartmouth College, completed his residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and later completed a fellowship there in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Uh, in 2010, he also completed the Intermountain Healthcare's Advanced Training Program in Healthcare Delivery Improvement, so also a great focus on uh, quality of care and healthcare. Dr. Riley's academic career started at Harvard, where he rose from instructor of medicine to associate professor. He was also an attending physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he served uh, in, in multiple roles, medical director of the lung transplant program, uh, the Center for Chest Diseases and the Pulmonary Rehabilitation Program, director of the bronchoscopy service and the pulmonary function lab, interim chief of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine and vice chair of Brigham's Integrated Clinical Services. So in addition to his substantial research program, also substantial clinical leadership, he's certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine and by the board's pulmonary subspecialty board, has a board certifi certificate of competence in clinical care, and is a fellow of the American College of Physicians. He's also past chair of NHLBI's clinical trial study section. So someone who truly has substantial expertise, both on the research and clinical sides of the mission, uh, and we're really, really pleased to have you here today, John. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Riley. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address you. My plan today is to spend about 15 minutes going through what uh, I've listed here on the slide as what I think the challenges we face at Academic Medical Center. This is a generic talk. I'm early in my conversations with people here, so I don't presume to be able to provide specific advice about this environment, although after the somewhat marathon day I've had today, I have a better perspective than I did when I put this slide deck together. And I hope um, along the way to uh, be able to share a little bit about my career as it interfaces with some of these topics we're talking about, but we'll be happy to expand on it in the Q&A. As I said, I plan to speak for maybe 15 minutes and then open it up for questions to allow people to hear, um, uh, pose questions about areas that are important to them. So I stole this slide from the American Association of Medical Colleges about the value that academic medical centers provide to um, uh, our society. And I think probably for all of us in the room, we understand the contributions that we all make jointly as a community to patient care, uh, teaching and research. Uh, as a uh, new grandparent of twins that were born seven weeks prematurely, I can testify to the value that academic medical centers bring, uh, uh, being now uh, the uh, grandparents of NICU um, uh, uh, residents. And I think we all uh, feel good about our contributions to this uh, mission of, of those three uh, missions in helping to forge the healthcare system that is in some senses viewed as one of the leaders in the world. and in other senses, still has opportunities for improvement. Now, so one personal bit of information about me is I'm a car guy. Um, you know, I, I like fast cars, um, much to the distress of my spouse, uh, who's 
Lisa, who's sitting in the back. Um, and so I like this slide because for most of my career, this is what medicine has been like, which is the view out the windshield has looked a lot like the view in the rear view mirror. Things have been changing, but changing relatively slowly. Um, and therefore, most people uh, practice their careers and uh, decide on their trajectories based on recent experiences and what's come just before. And I think the view out the windshield sort of looks like this now. Um, that uh, something's coming, nobody's quite sure what it is, um, but it's gonna be different. Um, and so the question is, how do we prepare for those differences? So for those of you who are fans of evolutionary biology, there was a Harvard professor, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who used to write a series of popular essays uh, that were published in the Flamingo Smile and some other books, uh, who popularized this notion that uh, of evolution being a process of punctuated equilibrium uh, rather than a continuous progressive change. And what he meant by that was this, that there are periods of relative stability um, in an ecosystem, which uh, changes occurred on sort of a microscopic level, followed by abrupt uh, changes in the environment that produce substantial changes in um, evolutionary pressure and in species. And you know, one example of that would be the, the disappearance of the dinosaurs, for instance. And I think it's uh, my premise that I'm going to base the rest of this, these remarks on is that we're at one of those inflections where we're entering one of these steep parts of the curve here, and things are changing um, quickly in academic medicine. So uh, what are the challenges? I think this is well, something that will be familiar to everybody in the audience. The uh, clinical landscape is changing rapidly. Um, the research landscape has uh, changed substantially since the doubling of the NIH budget. Um, and there's real pressures on our funding for research. And there are a lot of conversations that are putting pressures on, uh, or potential pressures on our funding for education. So really all three parts of that traditional three-legged stool are under some pressure in the current environment. And I'm gonna start by talking about the changing clinical landscape. So first of all, you'll hear a lot in the, in the world of academic medicine, no margin, no mission. If we don't make money, we can't invest money. Um, but I think it's important to remember that uh, the margin is not the mission. Uh, the mission are the things I alluded to earlier, and the margin is a tool to use to get to those uh, goals. So uh, with the advent um, of changes in the U.S. healthcare system, I think there are two things going on that uh, one has been talked about a lot, which is the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, and the other, which has received less attention, is the fact that everybody else's insurance has changed at the same time. So if you look across uh, U.S. healthcare now, uh, and I stole this slide from uh, one of the consultants I presented at a conference last week, Here's the average deductible for people who are buying plans on healthcare exchanges across the US. So if you buy a silver plan, which is where the government is pegging their subsidy levels, the average personal deductible is uh, over $2,500 uh, per year. And if you look at these broad market trends, um, you see pressure on reimbursement rates, the emergence of narrow networks, and in many markets around the country, those networks are specifically designed to exclude academic medical centers because of our cost structure. So if you go to Indianapolis and buy an exchange product, the University of Indiana is not in that exchange product. You go to Memphis and you buy an exchange product, Vanderbilt is not in that product. You go to LA and you buy an exchange product and UCLA and Cedar sinai are not in that product. Um, the emergence of integrated delivery systems where physicians and hospitals are working more in concert with, it, with each other, and there's this notion that we need to build scale to deliver care. And uh, the move, so, which is, I think, in its nascent stages of so-called volume to value, uh, moving towards paying for outcomes rather than um, office visits or uh, encounters. And what's resulted from this change in benefit design and this changing marketplace is more and more people are getting high deductible plans. Um, and as the healthcare economists have been predicting for the last 40 years, uh, when it's your personal money that you're writing a check with as opposed to what's perceived to be somebody else's money, people behave differently. So if people are saying, what is a desirable employer health insurance plan? They want wide coverage and very robust benefits. 
when people are being asked to say, what kind of plan would you buy for yourself if you had to pay for it? They're willing to accept a much narrower network and a much more defined set of benefits. So I would say, looking from the outside, if five years ago, if you came to Denver, you'd say, who is your competition? And you would say some of these other places around town. As this place has risen on the national um, profile, you say, who's your competition? And you would start throwing in things like MD Anderson, the Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, other nationally known brand, brands. But with this change in insurance benefit structure and in change in patient behavior, I would say these are our competition as well that now people are making purchasing decisions for their health care the same way they think about funding their kids' college plans, the same way they think about buying appliances or new cars, the same way about filling a tank with gas. And we are now in the conversation for how people want to spend their monthly budget, which means we need to do business differently than we traditionally have in medicine, medicine in general and academic medicine in particular. So those of you who read the New York Times might have seen this uh, article about um, probably uh, a week and a half ago now. Um, uh, a woman who had a previous uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral aneurysm, who basically is facing a $6,000 deductible and said, this year I'm not going to get my screening MRI. Um, I can't afford it and I'm not going to pay for it. So as I think you've heard in forums here uh, on this campus before, medicine has become a commodity. Um, and it's a consumer purchasing decision like many other uh, consumer purchasing decisions in our society, uh, albeit with a very different information base and a very different uh, ability to convey what real costs are. So this could be one approach to, to how we're going to deal with this. Um, uh, obviously, I put this up here because I don't think this is the right approach. Um, but I do think there's sort of four things I wanted to spend the last few minutes um, talking about that uh, I think all of us across the country need to do, and I think it's applicable to this environment based on what I've learned today, which is to build better connections with the community where most healthcare is delivered and where we all live and in which our academic medical centers uh, sit. Uh, we need to diversify in several respects, and I'll expand on that um, in a minute. Uh, we need to get better at what we do. We need to be more efficient at the, the way we um, deliver care. And um, we need, at the same time, uh, to be strategic about where we're going to invest our resources in order to take um, the enterprise to where we want it to be um, over the next uh, decade. So um, with respect to connecting with the community, um, uh, one of the things that's become clear as I talk to people um, who've been in Denver for a while is that 10 years ago, the public perception of the academic medical center in Denver was very different than it was now. And back then, it was the safety net hospital where people went who couldn't go to um, uh, other medical care facilities. And with the move out here and the reengineering of the school and what's going on in the hospital, this has now become a more desirable destination for all the population of Denver. And I think that trend needs to continue. Uh, people should want to come here. And when they get here, um, they should have a great experience, um, both on the uh, things that happen before they get into the exam room with the physician and with what happens while they're in the exam room uh, with the physician. And there are vestiges of the academic medical culture that don't view delivering convenient, high-quality patient care as an important part of the mission, that they're more focused on research or education. And that attitude, uh, which is waning quickly across the country, needs to continue to go away. Uh, we need to provide um, great care. Um, as I was uh, saying to somebody before this, if you look at a, a nocturnal satellite image of the Western United States, um, you see a big glowing dot that's Denver, and then you see a lot of nothing um, around it at night. Um, and as I heard several times today, th the numbers have varied from anywhere from 500 to 600 to 2,000 miles. But for a large swath of the uh, middle of the United States, you are the only academic uh, medical center. And that provides a great responsibility and a great opportunity to continue to build the brand and attract uh, patients from all over the region and all over um, the country. And I think um, we, University of Colorado, the Anschutz campus, need to tell the story so that not only do patients want to come here, but people recognize the value that this institution provides to the community 
and understands the need for community support for the missions that go on here. Um, and that we'll get back to that in the diversification. Um, and uh, I think we're entering an era both in research funding and in clinical care where strength begets strength. The rich are going to get richer. The really strong institutions are going to weather this and emerge stronger. And um, the opportunity here is to continue to recruit really uh, first-class clinicians and researchers. You have a great base here. You have a great reputation. And unfortunately, Lisa and I brought the weather from Pittsburgh with us today. But uh, ordinarily, um, an outstanding climate and a great city to um, recruit into. Um, the other point I put up there was diversification. And I mean that in uh, several sense of the word. So first of all, we need a diverse workforce at all levels. Um, med students, faculty, um, the rest of the care providers in our healthcare system. Um, uh, and I think for three reasons. Uh, one, because it's the right thing to do. We're, we're a diverse country. We're in a nation built on diversity. And I think um, uh, every people, every group of people deserves an opportunity uh, to excel. Uh, more pragmatically, from the point of view of leadership of a system like this, it's pretty clear that in the realm of research and business operations, uh, diverse teams perform better than teams that aren't diverse. Um, Different people bring different ideas to the table, and people who are bringing ideas to the table are better able to defend them when they know they have to present them to people who have different points of view. Um, and all the business literature supports this, and I think the medical literature supports it as well. And then I think we deliver better clinical care when our teams uh, that are delivering that care mirror the composition of the patients uh, who we take care of. The second aspect of diversity is the thing that nobody likes to talk about in academic medicine, but everybody spends a lot of time thinking about, which is money. Um, and um, uh, it's pretty clear from the, the background information that was supplied to me before this visit that uh, state funding is not the answer to funding issues uh, here on this campus. Um, there's a very compelling graphic, and there's a little red line that goes pretty straight across the bottom, uh, and that's the state funding line, um, which uh, you'll be happy to know, uh, or maybe unhappy to know, uh, substantially exceeds the state funding we get at the University of Pittsburgh, which is also a state institution. So um, uh, you may not get a lot, but there are people getting less, if that makes you feel any better. Um, uh, uh, like most places, I think uh, this institution and the one I'm at now have a heavy reliance on NIH funding. And um, with the um, basically level funding of the NIH over the last decade since the doubling, there's been a real erosion in the purchasing power of those dollars. Um, there may be some political um, will in the future. Uh, most people predict after the next presidential election that there may be a move afoot to raise the NIH budget. But clearly, we need to diversify the portfolio. Um, uh, and the two obvious ways to diversify it is um, to forge better relationships with industry. Uh, so I was joking with someone earlier today that the one thing everybody in academic medicine agrees on, they don't like their IRB and they don't like their technology transfer office. Um, I've never met anybody who's happy with both of those at any institution. Um, so clearly, we need to do better. Um, many of the big Pharma companies and science companies have decided that they're going to downsize their internal research programs and form strategic alliances with uh, educational institutions and academic medical centers. And I think to be successful, uh, any academic medical center needs to be part of that conversation and not be the last one to be able to process the contracts, not be um, uh, in endless uh, negotiations over the nuances of uh, certain uh, IP rights. And then philanthropy. Um, which um, some institutions are very good at and, and most are not. Um, and philanthropy really requires, I think, two things. One is a, a compelling story um, to tell about what the, the value of philanthropy is and what it will bring to the institution and to the community. And two, uh, relationships that allow you the opportunity to tell that story. Um, and in the world of academic medicine, if you talk to people who are really successful at raising money, um, those foundations start with the doctor-patient relationship. So the ability to get faculty engaged in an appropriate way uh, to start initiating those conversations with potential donors is uh, really important. And the last uh, M element of diversity that, and diversify I would speak to is the research portfolio, that there always has to be a place for basic discovery and mechanistic science in um, this kind of environment. 
Um, but there also has to be the ability to move those um, discoveries and insights through the translational spectrum uh, into clinical care. And the portfolio at a large place like this needs to reflect all of those activities. Um, I'll say a word about efficiency here. Uh, you heard in the introduction, I spent some time at it in Mountain a few years ago going through their um, uh, quality improvement course. And um, we know that we're expensive at academic medical centers. And we talk about the fact that we have a research and education mission contributes to our expense structure. But for many years, we've used that as an excuse not to be efficient where we could be efficient. And uh, clearly, with the pressure on pricing now, and the fact that people are going to be comparison shopping about where to go spend their healthcare dollar, uh, we need to make the system as efficient as possible, which means eliminating redundancy, creating multidisciplinary teams that will span departments, divisions, hospitals, physicians to solve problems, and do it with the same kind of data-based conclusions that we apply to our, our research uh, methodology. Uh, clearly, Science has evolved in the direction of team science now, and the tools used to do that team science can be very expensive. And therefore, we need to have the cores and shared uh, research facilities that can support that, but at the same time, don't duplicate things unnecessarily. And then I'll close um, with the last thing, which is strategic investment. I just uh, picked an example of something that I think spans the clinical and research spectrum which is the explosion of data that everybody's talking about now. People like to talk about personalized medicine, precision medicine, big data, integrating research data with clinical data. And there are a lot of challenges associated with that. Um, and building the infrastructure to collect and manage large data sets, um, manage them intelligently, decisions about where to store those data. Do you build your own facility? Do you put it in the cloud? If you put it in the cloud, how do you put it there safely? And more importantly, the tools to extract intelligence out of that data so you can actually draw supportable conclusions and make decisions based on those data are things that are common to both the scientific and clinical enterprises and an opportunity to both invest but invest in an efficient manner so that you share those costs across the uh, entire enterprise. So in closing, I, you know, this is the three-legged stool. So in addition to being a car guy, I'm a furniture guy. One of my hobbies is woodworking. And um, one of the premises, if you're building chairs or stools, is that this structure is a lot less stable than this structure. That if you put uh, what is illustrated at the bottom of these as the black X or the red O, which in the furniture trade are called stretchers um, that hold the legs together, you prevent them from splitting apart, and that stool can bear a lot more weight than the one on the left. Um, and I think the role of a leadership at an academic medical center is in the same role as the stretcher in this three-legged stool, providing that infrastructure that keeps those three missions together, makes the instrument, in this case the stool, perform better, um, and allows people to do what they do best. Um, and with that, I will close and open up the floor for questions. So we have a couple of microphones that will be going around the room. So if you'll you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you so that you can uh, ask your question and people can hear you. So we uh, have had discussions about uh, how basic science departments should be organized and or reorganized. And we also have very large numbers of PhD scientists in clinical departments. Uh, how do you think that uh, we should uh, uh, handle this issue and are, are PhDs to be regarded as the same? And what's the relationship to, between basic science departments and clinical departments? Well, it's a pressing question, I think, that uh, we all face. So the department I currently run, um, the Department of Medicine University of Pittsburgh, we have about 645 faculty, and about 110 of those are PhDs uh, focused on the, uh, on the research mission. Um, and it's clear that moving forward, the best science is going to be uh, team science. And the themes in science, the, the underlying mechanisms that underlie a lot of different diseases um, cross the traditional departmental and disease boundaries. So one of the challenges is, whatever structure you choose, how do you 
design it so that the structure actually doesn't get in the way of the people doing the work and uh, pursuing those themes. Um, I firmly believe that there is a clear role for PhDs in clinical departments, that they should be on equal footing with MD faculty, that the advantage of being in a clinical department for PhDs is the dialogue with physicians who have patient contact that can provide some context and perspective on what the pressing clinical problems are and help uh, people formulate their research questions in a way that's likely to provide insight and translate back uh, to the bench. Um, as to what the specific basic science department should be, uh, I think is, you know, worthy of an open dialogue. I don't have a fixed structure in my mind that there should be structural biology, you know, immunology, microbiology. Um, I think the move is to move more of them around scientific themes, um, but I really think it's the goal of department chairs and leadership to make that structure not matter and to put people together who are doing things in common. And uh, if, uh, if the, the questions lag here, I'm happy to expand uh, more on what we've done about that. Um, in, in my current environment, but I tell all my faculty, my job is to make sure that the department doesn't get in your way. And if you're going to collaborate with people in other departments, that's fine and to be encouraged. Let me um, follow up on Professor Fried's question about the role of basic scientists as a former chair of basic science departments and a couple other universities. Um, I, I have a perspective that also includes translational science, but, but not exclusively. And um, the way you phrased um, the importance of research, uh, you indicated that basic discovery is important. Um, but I think then you went on to say, but, but it also is important that it leads to um, uh, clinical translation. Does it all have to lead to clinical translation, or is there still a place for the basic scientists? For example, the, the guy in the office next to me is a member of the National Academy. He doesn't do translational research, but his research is top flight, and he continues to be funded. And my concern is whether individuals like him and others are a dying species in medical centers as we look at the, the shift toward clinical income as a way of of supporting us, especially in a state that doesn't throw a lot of money our way. Thanks. So I, um, so if if I uh, implied that all research has to translate to the bedside, that is a miscommunication on my part. I, I think we're remarkably bad at predicting what basic observations are going to eventually translate into improvements in clinical care, um, and uh, the the way to generate a portfolio of ideas that may translate eventually into clinical care is um, to uh, support fundamental and mechanistic research. Um, and I think, to, but it's our responsibility to try to be rigorous about who's really good at it and who's actually doing really good and important work and um, uh, so and are worthy of support with what are going to be increasingly pressured uh, resources. But we would um, be remiss, I think, if we didn't support that kind of activity because we, uh, those are where the insights that they may not make medical care different five years from now or 10 years from now, but 25 years from now very well could. And we don't know which observations those are going to be. So I think you have to, um, you know, take the sort of Bell Labs, Howard Hughes kind of approach, which is uh, try to pick really good talent, um, and the, their deliverable is good work, but not good work targeted at a therapeutic you know, intervention or immediate translation to the to the bedside. So my question is about academic medical centers becoming systems. Uh, instead of a single hospital, having multiple hospitals, multiple clinics, multiple practices. So uh, what, what, what are your views, and I know, I know you have experience with that at your place, uh, what are your views about the challenges and issues and threats to the academic mission as we behave that way, as we evolve our hospitals into bigger systems that cover bigger populations? 
Well, I think there's two things implicit in your uh, question. And the first, I think, is a structural one, which is what should a healthcare system look like in the future? And, uh, you know, I think we, we're evolving away from a hospital-centered architecture to something that has a much greater emphasis on ambulatory and community-based care, where the hospitals are a component of it, but my prediction would be 10 years from now, they're not going to be the economic engine that drives the whole enterprise the way they traditionally have, because I think reimbursement is going to change and there's going to be more emphasis on keeping people out of the hospital. But having said that, to get back to your relationship between community-delivered medicine and what has traditionally been um, in a non-teaching, non-research environment and how that interfaces with an academic medical center when you um, basically get in bed together in a shared system, um, I think you have to have uh, frank conversations up front about what the interests of all the parties are, and then create structures that uh, recognize those interests and acknowledge them. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of private practice people interested coming into a system if you say, we're going to tax all of your clinical revenues to support the research mission, oh. right? Um, and um, uh, conversely, you're not going to get be able to recruit research-oriented physicians into your academic medical center if you say we're going to send you out to the suburbs four days a week to, to do eight clinic sessions a week um, away from the home campus. So, um, you know, there's this saying in the world of academic medicine, if you've seen one academic medical center, you've seen one academic medical center. So I think the problem is that you allude to is generic. The solutions, I think, are specific and quite local and, you know, involve a set of dialogues and negotiations with all the parties involved. You're correct that in my prior experience, I can draw on examples from both Boston and the Western Pennsylvania area of different arrangements that have worked for those particular parties. Um, it doesn't mean that that's the template that one would necessarily apply here, but it would at least give you a framework to start thinking about things. So I want to go back to um, some of the things we're talking about as regards research. One of the discussions that we've been having interminably here for years is, uh, is, is revolves around the idea that we can't really in the current era be competitive in every area of biomedical sciences and we have to find some way of focusing. I guess my question is whether you agree with that idea that we have to focus and philosophically if you do, how do you go about choosing which areas you focus on and more importantly, which areas you do not focus on? So I would say from a pragmatic point of view, idealistically, I would like to say you could be good at all things, but I think from a pragmatic point of view, um, uh, that's not an immediately achievable goal. So I think the answer to your first part of your question is yes, I think you have to pick an area of focus. Um, and I think in broad terms, there are two ways you could go about doing that. One would be to inventory your current talent and decide where your areas of best strength are and build upon those. Um, use those to nucleate um, a larger program and investment and uh, build on that enterprise. And then a complementary strategy would be to look at the scientific landscape and decide where you think the best opportunities are to make significant advances and decide to build programs there. If you're really lucky, those two lists overlap um, and you can um, uh, prioritize your investments that way, but that, that those are the two ways I would look at the look at the problem because you know resources are not infinite, and I think you you know the question is whether you want to be broad and shallow, so to speak, or whether you want to have a few areas where you're really internationally recognized as being thought leaders and driving the agenda, and if you do those, if you do the latter, then I think you have the opportunity to recruit more people in that can help fill in the gaps between those centers of excellence over time. But initially, I think you have to prioritize your investments and pick some areas of focus. Uh, compared to industry, uh, translation from uh, a discovery into a clinically valuable uh, treatment, uh, seems to be slower in, in academic medicine because the, you know, the incentives are to be more careful, risk adverse, and there's not that great an incentive to speed things up. 
And of course, we don't want to make any mistakes because that's a catastrophe, but uh, running as a business, this isn't very efficient. So do you have any great ideas from <laughs> your experience as to how you know, we might be able to uh, speed up without uh, risking any uh, adverse consequences? Well, I think um, you highlight, uh, I think, an important problem. And I think if you look at what's going on at the NIH right now, um, they agree with you. So if you look at the new funding award announcement for the CTSA awards, it's um, about efficiency and creating a large national clinical trials network. If you look in the National Heart, Lung, and Blood, the RFAs that we just responded to are now no longer disease specific. It's you're going to be a site for pulmonary clinical trials and um, there's a much more focus on your ability to recruit and recruit in a timely fashion, and now a mandate that everybody has to use a central IRB, um, which is a, a big departure for the NIH. So, um, uh, you know, I've written these clinical investigation grants, and I participate in a number of these clinical investigator networks, and I, and I think, uh, by definition, we are an optimistic bunch. Um, everybody um, is... Uh, uh, usually overly optimistic about the rate at which they will re recruit to clinical trials. They're overly optimistic about the size of the population that they're going to recruit from and uh, overly optimistic about the rate of people who are going to provide consent. So I think to attack the problem, there's a few things you have to do, which is I think you have to parallel the pro parallel process, the things you can do in parallel. You have to um, uh, Agree to play in the sandbox with other institutions. You know, everybody, you know, th this, con this notion of using central IRBs, using master clinical trial agreements that span multiple institutions, um, those things have to take place. I think you have to take advantage of your informatic resources, your electronic health records, patient registries, and those kinds of things to provide a, a refined pool to um, people looking to enroll humans so that the um, enrollment rate in those trials, the success rate for getting people into the trial is higher, you know, to basically provide an enriched population. Um, and then I think you'll see um, the other thing that actually, I think, has actually been quite efficient on the part of the NIH at motivating behavior is they now write these cooperative agreements with milestones. And if you're not hitting the milestones, they turn off your site. Um, and it turns out that when people do that, people hit their milestones. Um, so I think it's a combination of those strategies. Uh, you know, talk to every patient who walks through the door here about the value of research and get them into a research registry and the ability to contact them later. Develop the tools to, to give you a population that's got a higher hit rate and then get some of the administrative overhead out of the way so that when you actually get ready to do the trial, there isn't that big, you know, nine-month valley of death while you're waiting for the IRB and the contract office and all that to go through. All those, I think, are achievable. Not, you know, they sound simple in concept, but they are, I think, achievable goals. They just require some sustained effort. If we could change tact a little bit, could you speak to your overall management style, particularly in uh, administrative leadership of large departments and how that uh, might translate to this particular position? Uh, sure. So I would say um, I'm a fairly frank and blunt person, and um, the people who like me say I'm honest, and the people who don't like me say I'm overly frank and overly um, blunt. Um, uh, my uh, my experience in having, um, and I alluded to this in one of my meetings earlier today, having been through the merger of the partner system in Boston and watched the Beth Israel and Deaconess merge across the street from us, um, uh, in the absence of information, I think everybody in those uh, ventures feels like they're being taken advantage of. So when I was at the Brigham, we were convinced that we were getting screwed because the, t the table was tilted in favor of the MGH. And when I talked to my colleagues at the MGH, they felt exactly the converse, that they were being taken advantage of and all the resources were going to the Brigham. And part of that was because nobody knew where the resources were going. So, you know, my belief is to the extent that it's appropriate, you know, not down to individual salaries, et cetera, but to the extent it's appropriate to be very transparent about the data so people know what the priorities are, where you're putting the resources. Um, and, um, and then I would say the last thing about my leadership style is uh, the the, the twofold maxim, uh, 
don't promise what you can't deliver and then deliver what you promise. Um, I personally am not a micromanager. Uh, I believe that you get good people and you, you get them because they're good. You put them in positions to do the things they want to do and then you let them do them and try to be aware of what's going on but not micromanaging the decisions. Um, and uh, the role of leadership in that is to provide advice when people ask for it and to help get rid of barriers when people encounter barriers that need a higher level of intervention. And this is sort of a more general philosophical thing. Um, if you apply for a job as a dean of a medical school, you must have an idea in your back of your mind as to what you think success in that position would look like or failure would look like. So can you tell us what you think success would be if you were to come here in five years' time? What would that look like? Yeah, I think uh, five years' time, if I were to come here, success would be that um, this was widely recognized as the place everybody in this part of the country wanted to come and get care. And that in the scientific community, people um, recognized that there were important contributions coming out of the research enterprise here. Um, and um, I think both of those are achievable, ambitious, but achievable um, successes. Whether those research contributions have to be in a specific area, I think um, I don't have strong feelings about that. I think you want the best people doing good work. Um, and I think if you create that environment, as I said earlier, I think you get into that positive feedback loop where strength begets strength. The best trainees and postdocs will want to come here to train. Um, uh, then you retain the best of those and continue to build your enterprise. This is uh, related to your focus on philanthropy. So what compelling story are you telling about your current department or institution? And in your opinion, in the short time that you've uh, been exposed here, uh, what is your one compelling story that you might be able to tell about the Anschutz Medical Campus? Well, you guys have a great medical center here, right? It's physically, it's beautiful. Um, and the physical plan is important, but more important is what happens in, inside the physical plan. And um, I think uh, the recurrent theme I've heard from various department chairs um, uh, and other people over the course of the day is that when people come here, um, the um, clinical care experience has, um, when they finally get through the door here, the clinical care experience has more than matched the physical plan, that people have a really good experience, and um, and some of those people are pleasantly surprised by that um, fact, which speaks to the ability to, you know, the need to raise expectations within the community. Um, I think uh, probably the, in addition to sort of clinical programs, which are in some senses easy to tell stories about, um, conveying the value that the research enterprise provides to the local area and to society as a whole, I think is really important. Um, if I look over the course of my career, and I say this to my interns and residents all the time, so they're really sick of hearing it. You know, when I was in medical school, there was no such thing as hepatitis C, undiscovered disease. It was non-A, non-B hepatitis. And now with the latest generation of antivirals released, we, you can cure 98% of hepatitis C with 12 weeks of therapy. There was no such thing as HIV when I entered medical school. Uh, and then I spent my pulmonary fellowship bronchoscoping uh, young gay guys in Boston who were dying of, you know, pneumocystis and tuberculosis and Kaposi sarcoma. And you all probably saw that movie, The Streets of Philadelphia, where, you know, this was the plague that was going to sweep the world. And now when I hear about it in residents report every week, it's sort of like having type 2 diabetes. It's a chronic disease. People are managed on it. And the people I see when I do my consult rotations on inpatient pulmonary consults who, have, who are admitted with problems related to HIV either didn't know they had it, so it's their initial diagnosis, or they stopped taking their medicines and got, got sick. So and you can go right down the line, targeted therapies and cancer and all that. So the contributions and the way healthcare has changed and the way it's likely the science is exploding over the next 10 to 15 years can dramatically change the face of what we can offer patients. And I think that's not appreciated by the public. And I think that's the story we can tell. Um, and hopefully that will resonate with enough people that they'll continue to support that mission. Hi. 
Hi. Can you comment a little bit on some of the challenges and opportunities facing the educational mission, specifically at the UME and GME levels? Sure. Um, so the challenge, I think, um, at the UME level, um, uh, there are still a lot of people who want to be doctors um, and uh, applying to medical school. Uh, making sure that that's a diverse group that reflects our population, I think, is a bit of a challenge. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that happens is the amount of debt we settle them with as they go through their four years of um, uh, undergraduate medical education. And the fact that at our, at least at our place and in many places, the education they get is not dramatically different in organization than the education I got when I was in medical school. And in fact, the way we deliver healthcare is changing rapidly. And I think um, the, the way we deliver education has to change rapidly. And that I would start by saying that needs to include constituents other than medical students, uh, that uh, the other medical professions need to be in the in the educational mix um, right from the start, um, and that that needs to continue through the graduate medical education um, level. Um, I think the big threat in graduate medical education is what CMS is going to do with the, the DME, IME um, money, particularly the IME, which seems to be um, on the um, chopping block. Um, uh, I don't know that training more doctors is the answer to the health care shortage in the U.S., but I think training doctors to work in teams and structuring that training so that they actually know how to function effectively in teams, because we've spent the last hundred years training doctors to be lone rangers, basically. Um, and the, the notion that um, uh, they need to function as part of an interprofessional team and actually have the leadership and management skills, you know, which people teach in industry and business and in the armed forces, but we traditionally have not done in medicine, um, is, a, is a real opportunity. And um, maintaining the diversity all the way through that stream up into the faculty level or practitioner in the community is um, uh, obviously an important priority and, and been a challenge uh, historically and remains one that needs constant attention. As a car guy, I'm tempted to ask you um, <laughs> about uh, the new Dodge Hellcat or Corvettes <laughs> and why we need 650 or 707 horsepower. But yeah. Maybe we could chat about that later. Yeah. But this is America because we can, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when, uh, when T. Franklin Williams was president and CEO of Cornell University, he wrote an article that I just love. Um, I think it was called The Art of the Presidency. And I think your role here is much like a CEO or president of a major university, considering you have a faculty of 2,500 or whatever it is now. Um, and in there, he stressed three things, and you've touched on one of them. And, and the first was that leaders need to be visionaries uh, and plant those seeds. And then secondly, they need to find resources so that the really brilliant faculty, and we have them here, can push new frontiers and new vistas. And the third, and I th think you already said that, is once you do that, you stay out of their way. Right. Um, and so my question to you is, are you a visionary? And if so, where would you find the resources? Uh, well, uh, whether I'm a visionary well, we I think is, is uh, other people. So I happen to think I'm a visionary. Um, um, and uh, as to where you find the resources, um, I think there's no one single answer to that. Uh, I do think if you reorganize your clinical care system in a way to deliver, reliably deliver first-rate care um, and focus on the outcomes rather than how many people walk through the turnstile every day um, and took risk for a population, you could improve the health of that population and you could make a lot of money. Um, um, and you could then take that money and invest it to let the brilliant people do the things they do um, really well. Um, so I think that part is actually in some ways the easiest part of it. Um, uh, it's getting this, it's trying to uh, get the system to buy into your vision and reorganize because uh, this is a very successful enterprise. The place I am now is a very successful enterprise. When people are failing, it's an easier conversation to tell them that they need to do something different. Right. Um, when people have been successful doing things a certain way, and what you're saying is around the next bend, the world is going to change and you need to do things differently, that's a harder conversation because 
people are really good at what they do now, and to get them to do something differently and give up success, guarantee success, is, um, is more of a challenge. And I think, so that's going to be the challenge for whoever takes this position, is, is to not to say that we need to do things differently, um, because I think most people agree, and we can argue over how you should organize things differently, but to actually convince people to do it differently, I think, is going to be the, is the big challenge. I'd like to ask about professionalism. Uh, as an example, uh, we know from the graduate questionnaire uh, that uh, 40 to 45 percent of medical students believe that they've been humiliated or mistreated physically or mentally during their time in medical school. What sorts of things have you done in your department to look at professionalism in that area and at all the other levels? Yeah, I mean, that's a disturbing statistic, obviously. Um, uh, so what we've done in our department is um, it's a part of the residency curriculum. Um, we get a, um, anonymous survey feedback from both our medical students and our trainees on a regular basis. And um, uh, when trends are identified, um, then it's one of the less desirable aspects of being a department chair that uh, I actually call those people in and have a conversation. Um, and sometimes that conversation is, you need to change behavior. Sometimes that conversation is, you're entering a specific program targeted at the behavior that you're exhibiting. Uh, sometimes that conversation is, you're going to be out of the workplace until you enter a program that targets um, that behavior. Uh, because um, it is not tolerated. The second thing we've done, and this is a school of medicine-wide initiative, is it's uh, a specific evaluation on professionalism is now part of every, is a, is a mandatory part of every faculty member's annual review. Um, and so in my department, I read all of those, and any of the red flags that come up, uh, we have a more extensive uh, discussion about that. Um, the fear is, of course, that if, 40% as you cite in your survey here, or some percentage of people are reporting that, that's probably under-reporting what actually goes on uh, because many people won't report it because of fear of reprisal. Um, and you can't fix what you don't know about. So we spend a lot of time talking to our trainees and med students about the confidentiality of these surveys and the fact that they are anonymous and can't, won't be traced back to them in order to try to reduce that barrier to reporting. We just asked, John, you've been very, very successful at two fabulous places, at the, at the Brigham and, and at Pittsburgh. Why do you want to be a dean? And, yeah, uh, so and that's why, a, good, a good question. Why, why question. do you want to be a dean here? This is a terrific place, but you've been at great places. Yes. Um, so uh, my dear wife is in the back row there. Uh, uh, has, has said to me, uh, you've got one good run left. You know, you just turned 58. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, uh, you should be in an environment where you can make an impact about the stuff you care passionately about. So I love my job at UPMC. Um, so the reason to come here would be because I think the opportunity here to do something really exciting um, and really impactful is um, higher than what the opportunity is at UPMC. Um, I think the good thing about the dean's position and the bad thing about the dean's position is you span all of the departments. So, so the good thing is, so I talked to you earlier, I think the role of leadership is to remove those barriers that, you know, we create a structure in order to manage an enterprise, but then we can't let the structure interfere with the ability of the enterprise to do what, they, what it's going to do well, whether that's at the clinical end of the spectrum or the research end of the spectrum. And I think you're in the dean's position, you're in a better position to um, mediate and make sure that interdepartmental or inter inter institute or intercenter divisions don't get in the way of uh, doing um, uh, good work. Um, uh, the bad thing is, is you're a little more removed from the front lines, and um, sometimes the information you get is more filtered. So the challenge will be, to, you know, to stay connected so that you have a really sense, a really good sense of whether you're being effective or not. I came for the rain, actually. Uh, 
I agree uh, completely with your ideas about team science uh, and uh, uh, people working together from all walks of life, particularly uh, the clinician and the basic scientists. One of the problems, however, is, is that to fulfill that, the clinician scientist role is critical. Yet, if you look at the statistics concerning clinician scientists, their numbers are decreasing markedly. Do you have any ideas about how that could be changed? Uh, if you believe the NIH statistics, are probably in 10 years, they're not going to be any more clinician scientists. So the entire role of team science may take on a completely different look than it does now. Well, I think you highlight an important point. And as a clinician scientist myself, um, uh, you know, I'm interested in the preservation of my breed and um, uh, my job description, because I do think uh, we bring value to the enterprise. Um, and I think part of the problem that the NIH has been um, is they've really front-loaded the pipeline. So th I think they've been pretty conscientious about K awards and, you know, T32s and F32s and all that. And then people drive out of the end of that pipeline and bang, you know, the, the, the world of independent research funding is um, uh, highly competitive. So I, I think the leadership at um, academic institutions um, needs to develop a very discerning eye about the talent that they're going to support through that transition. Because I think there are still people who want to do that. Um, but they need support, and they need support for a longer time than they did in my era. You know, it, it was a very realistic expectation to get a K award coming out of fellowship when, when I was a fellow. You don't see people getting KO8s and K23s at the end of a fellowship now unless they were an MD, PhD going into that fellowship. It's a couple years later. And if you tell somebody they have to pay their whole salary by seeing patients until they get their K award, they never get the data to get their K award. So I think we actually have to narrow up the funnel a little bit at the beginning and a little, be a little more discerning about who we invest in, but then realize that we have to invest in them for a longer period of time um, to get them on the footing where um, they can compete successfully. And then academically, we have to do a better job of recognizing team science. Um, you know, um, if you're a, uh, in the current environment, if you're a responsible mentor for a trainee, you tell them you want to be first author and last author. Those are the two things that count. And there is no paper anymore that just has two authors, right? I mean, um, and so what about all those people in between? Um, uh, and how to recognize the substantive contributions those other people make and give them credit in the promotions and recognition process, I think, is an important thing that we're going to have to wrestle with as an academic community. Uh, when I first came to Colorado, Tom Starzl was just uh, having his first success with liver transplants, and there was a feeling that uh, his uh, ICU liver patients were consuming too many resources of the hospital and that uh, he was taking too big a piece of the pie. Now, Pitt uh, managed to find there, there could be a bigger pie. Yeah, it, was, and, it became uh, a very big pie, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I wonder uh, what you see as the role of the hospital in uh, supporting the medical school? Well, I think, um, you know, the realities are uh, currently um, a lot of the money comes through the hospital. Um, and, um, and we care for patients in the hospital, and we should be partners with the hospital in providing excellent care and helping the hospital run well. Um, I think, you know, all the quality improvement and efficiency literature is if you want to make something run better, you actually go down to the front lines and talk to the people who are actually doing the work. I mean, that's the basis of the Toyota method, right? You go to the assembly line and talk to the workers. They'll tell you, you know, what could be better. Um, and uh, to form an effective partnership so that um, you can convince the hospital to reinvest in the, in the academic mission. But it means being a responsible partner not treating, this is a little bit of an exaggeration, but, you know, I've been in, in, in situations where, you know, physicians have treated uh, the hospital the way they used to treat pharma reps, right, which is we, we just want your money. We don't actually want you to contribute to the conversation. Um, they just viewed it as a place, as a piggy bank to go get resources, but weren't actually willing to partner. And that 
you know, won't fly. But I think if you can make the hospital a better place and provide good care and be an attraction for patients into the hospital, then you can have a conversation with the hospital leadership about supporting the both the research and the educational missions. So um, the research mission at our institution and many institutions is largely fueled by graduate students and postdocs. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role for the School of Medicine to support the training mission of the graduate school? Well, I don't know how you're organized here, but um, the where I am now, we do. So we have, um, I think, 53 graduate students right now who are doing um, their um, thesis work in laboratories within the Department of Medicine. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, my dean uh, charges me full tuition for the privilege of having those graduate students in the labs. But, um, um, uh, and I do think so. I think the conversation we're having at our medical school and our School of Biologic Sciences now is how big should that program be? Uh, apropos of the earlier discussion about um, the vanishing physician scientists, you know, there's been a lot of literature about the size of the biomedical workforce and is the pyramid structure of one senior investigator with multiple postdocs a sustainable one long term or are we training people with the notion that they're going to become independent investigators when that's, there aren't going to be that many independent investigators and what implications that has for the size of training programs I think is a legitimate discussion. So there's this uh, national conversation going on about health care reform right now that's largely organized around the AAA. Um, and, but it's an open question as to how academic health centers fit into those three aims. I heard you say, uh, I, I heard you essentially commit to responsibility for improving health care and commit to responsibility for doing that at a lower cost. But the third of the triple aims has to do with improving the health of populations or the population. In our case, it could be the state or it could be the nation. Uh, and uh, we're trying to work our way through what our role, if any, is in improving the health of populations, some of whom get their care at all kinds of places. So I'm interested in your thoughts about what the uh, responsibility or the role of a place like this is in improving the health of the people who, let's say, live in this state? Sure. Well, I think the answer to that is to develop the tools to, to do that, right? So there are plenty of examples in medicine where, um, uh, so, you know, the estimates are about half the people with hypertension in the U.S. are not being treated effectively for their hypertension, right? And the, the issue there is not that we don't have good medications for hypertension. There are you know, medications now that have much better side effect profiles than 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, the issue there is getting people to take the medicine, right? So um, a, a role an academic medical center like this uh, could play is um, uh, understanding the factors that contribute to adherence, um, uh, really doing a rigorous job of looking um, at interventions that could um, influence adherence, um, and, and then um, uh, making those tools available to the broader healthcare community. I mean, the fact of the matter is most estimates are that the healthcare system, as we define it, um, uh, is responsible for about 10% of the, the influence on U.S. health. And uh, personal behavior, smoking, eating habits, exercise, or the lack thereof, um, driving cars too fast, um, uh, those kinds of things, um, uh, contribute to 50% or more of the uh, health status of society. So um, if you really wanted to move the needle on population health, it's developing the tools that look at um, ways to facilitate people changing their behavior in a sustainable fashion. And I think academic medical centers can lead in the research in providing those tools. It's a broader societal question about how you disseminate those tools out into the population and the role of public health versus clinical health care delivery systems. So I'm going to follow up on Frank's good question and 
uh, put this in the context of the part of the position that is the Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs in which you'll be interacting uh, on this campus and leadership role with the deans of the other schools and, and, and ask you about your experience in Pittsburgh, um, which is also a very comprehensive academic health center. What, what sorts of experiences have you had working with nursing or public health or pharmacy or other health professions to address some of the issues that, that Frank's been raising about population health or healthcare quality improvement, either inside or outside the healthcare system? I would point to uh, two examples, I guess. Uh, one is the way we're structuring uh, some of our clinical practices in the Department of Medicine. So we have four um, NCQA level three patient center medical homes, which um, as you know from that methodology include um, pharmacy services, um, in uh, some cases behavioral health, um, nursing case managers, um, and mid-levels and uh, physicians. Um, and we're currently engaged in a, a pilot program under a, a, a different funding mechanism to basically do the Camden hotspotting thing, which is taking really high utilizing patients from our healthcare system and embedding them in a comprehensive multidisciplinary um, uh, practice model um, intended to improve their outcomes. And you won't be surprised that our first cut through that data shows that behavioral health and um, uh, mental health issues are a large component of that um, patient population, leading us to embed more behavioral health in, in, in our practices. Uh, the second area where I have personal experience in doing that is in our Clinical and Translational Science Institute. I, I run the core that does the clinical research infrastructure there. And we actually have um, clinical research facilities targeted at different areas of uh, research expertise, including uh, rehabilitation medicine and physical therapy interventions, uh, women's health, pediatrics, um, sleep and uh, neurologic health, which draw investigators from all schools, you know, education, nursing, the school of public health, uh, physical therapy and rehabilitation sciences that um, engage in um, their research agendas under that uh, large umbrella. So I interact with them in that setting. I'm a captive audience, you aren't, so. Um. <laughs> 